indie games are pretty great. While they may not place as much emphasis on massive graphics or playtime inflation as their AAA counterparts, oftentimes these bite-sized experiences are better than whatever the industry's dumping out anyway. Imagine making Balin Wonderworld, right? Like, imagine being Square Enix and investing time and resources into it and shipping it for 60 full dollars, and then some guy goes, I think I will make a little bird game and sell it for 99 cents thing is, these little gifts to the world that are indie games don't have the same mass appeal or marketing that come with the standard Mario's or Call of Duty's, so it's up to me to spread the good word about these games so they can get the appreciation they deserve. That doesn't sound incredibly self-righteous, does it? Step aside, drawn to life for the Nintendo DS, there's a new drawing game in town, and you play as a dog. A drawing dog. I, I could see why the prototype was called Draw Dog. <laughs> Have you ever looked at a game and said, I want to draw on that like it's the placemat at a restaurant and I've just been handed a jumbo sized box of crayons? Well, look no further. In Chicory, your job is to become the new wielder of a magical paintbrush and restore color to the world while helping out cute animals along the way. The defining aspect of the entire experience is that every single screen is a blank canvas, a coloring book waiting to be beautified or ruined by your mischievous little hands. You can use buckets, textures, stamps, or freehand it to write dumb shit in the sky, on the ground, wherever you please. It's fun to just sling paint all over the world. You can draw paths to swim through, color trees and buildings however you like, and even draw on the floor or walls to remind yourself of secrets to come back for later. Paintings you create in art class are displayed across the towns and cities, and looking at the world map after you've scribbled your way through the story evokes the same heartwarming feeling as looking at a toddler completed drawings, except you're the toddler. As you explore the Picnic province to uncover the source of some mysterious growing distortions, you're presented with a bunch of fun and clever puzzles that utilize the brush in different ways. The game isn't complete with just puzzles though, as another huge aspect of Chicory is the storytelling. The writing for this game really shines in the main story dialogue, which explores topics that artists and creatives will connect most deeply and directly with. The pressure of succeeding a lineage of living up to the expectations of others, finding your own artistic style and path in life, anxiety, depression, the whole nine yards. As a self-proclaimed more than just a shill for products influencer, there were more than a handful of lines that punched me straight in the gut, and the finale was even more awesome and cheesy than I could have expected. With Celeste being one of my favorite video games and soundtracks of all time, hearing a new fully dynamic score by Lena Rain was literally music to my ears. Boss battles are ominous and intense, cutscenes are emotional, and the world as a whole is filled with so many cool instruments and motifs that I had to keep myself from melting into a smiling puddle while listening to any of the overworld music. And speaking of puddles, every sound effect in this game sounds like it came from a puddle. Goopiest sound effect I've ever heard. I mean, for a game about watercolor painting, the sound design is on point. Listen to these. Okay, well, some of them are a little gross, but... Oh, that's... Stop! Stop! Stop playing that one! Stop it! Since Chicory is all about art, creativity, and self-acceptance, there are a bunch of little conversations scattered about that made me laugh or brought a warm, fuzzy feeling to my cold gamer heart. There's an adult that definitely isn't just two kids in a trench coat, a snake that asks for help setting up a party so he can meet new friends, and even Frog Detective from the game Frog Detective shows up to talk about the importance of vacations and work-life balance. However, there are over a hundred characters, and the game can't spend much time fleshing them all out, so when a small chunk of dialogue boxes has to do, conversations occasionally feel awkward when things get more serious. A few animals will hastily dump their life story on you upon your first meeting, and going from seeing a frog in a car and hugging my dog sister to two animals hashing it out about the inherent flaws of capitalism and the specifics on how instating a society without money would succeed just feels not at home in the game's world at all. 
In the grand scheme of things, the few gripes I had don't come anywhere close to stopping me from wholeheartedly recommending Chicory, as the concept of designing a video game that lets the player express their emotions and creativity feels so unique and comforting. The whole game is basically the word wholesome given physical form, with the little asterisk at the end that adds a tiny bit of eldritch horror. I've played a lot of rhythm games. I grew up playing Guitar Hero and Rock Band, then moved on to grinding OS almost daily for a few years, then Beat Saber, Gotcha Arcade rhythm games and washing machines in Japan, Persona spin-offs, you get the idea. So anyway, all of that was just to give more oomph to the following sentence. Rhythm Doctor is easily the most creative and captivating rhythm game I've ever played. The only other rhythm game story I can even think of off the top of my head is Elite Beat Agents, where you gotta stomp clap to Hooba Stank to save the world from no music allowed aliens. The premise of Rhythm Doctor is incredibly simple. To remedy the heartbeats of hospital patients, you have to tap one button on every seventh beat. Sounds boring, but it gets increasingly more difficult and mind-blowing as each level introduces its own little twists. Each patient has their own affliction, causing anything from music and screen corruption to swing rhythm and irregular timing. Heartbeats have different rhythms, muted notes, and speeds, so treating multiple patients at the same time will really test your musical abilities. The game also uses these mechanics to enhance the stories of various patients. There's a musician who feels like he can't work without coffee, but his caffeine addiction contributes to his arrhythmia. His song about the stresses of creating hits so close to home that it's gonna rip my heart out so it doesn't have beats anymore. I punish myself by depriving my health of the things that I like until I fix this. But it doesn't really help, I just get more depressed, I do even less cause I can't work when I'm stressed. There's an injured old couple trying to call each other every night, an insomniac warrior with a Wi-Fi signal virus, and a bunch of birds? Just when you think you've got a hang of what's going on, or you think the game can't throw any more creativity at you, Rhythm Doctor says fuck it. While Rhythm Doctor is technically in early access, I believe it's already worth the $16 price tag, despite its current length of around 3 hours. The short playtime isn't a drawback though, as it demonstrates just how much care and effort has been put into every second of its gameplay, as every level is bursting with new ideas, jamming tunes, and gorgeous visuals. I'm super excited to play the rest of the game as it releases in the future, and included in the current version is a surprisingly versatile mapping tool that's already led to a bunch of really cool custom songs. Nintendo is too afraid to publish their music outside of Japan because of compulsory mechanical licenses, but Rhythm Doctor is out here putting a YouTube link to the entire soundtrack in a main menu button. Scourgebringer is a tough, fast-paced, roguelite platformer about dashing through the air, deflecting bullets, and racking up stylish combos by slaughtering entire rooms of demons and robots without getting hit. The game's bread and butter is found in its core movement and combat mechanics, a super fast and floaty character reminiscent of Madeline in Celeste. Kyra can double jump, wall jump, and dash in any chosen direction while swinging her sword at light speed and shooting ranged blasts at enemies. Okay, maybe it's it's a bit more complicated than Celeste, I don't remember Madeline carrying an assault rifle up the mountain. The gameplay of Scourgebringer moves at a breakneck pace, and cutting your way through hundreds of enemies in lush pixel art environments is incredibly satisfying. After seeing the game's colorful aesthetic, blood pumping heavy metal wasn't exactly my first thought of what it would sound like, but goddamn if the music doesn't make you feel like an absolute legend while smashing your way through hordes of enemies. I love some variety in my game sound 
soundtracks and Scourgebringers OST feels super unique for the genre, albeit a little repetitive at times. But as a roguelite, it's quite a light one. Like putting a room temperature LaCroix up next to a Coke freestyle machine, it isn't necessarily tasteless, but replayability and build variety aren't exactly strong points. Hell, 80% of the game's core mechanics are given to you during the tutorial. The combo mechanic encourages the use of every move in your arsenal while also pushing you to not get hit or touch the ground, but both permanent tree upgrades and temporary run pickups don't feel all that impactful. They're very necessary to continue through each location and deal adequate damage, but they often take the form of 5% more sword damage, ammo reloads faster, or gun now stuns enemies, rather than entirely new abilities that change the flow of battle. Since it's hard to feel overpowered from a build, the game expects you to learn everything inside and out, from the intricacies of deflecting projectiles and cancelling enemy attacks, to memorizing each ability and interaction in your arsenal. The combination of all this game knowledge allows you to make hundreds of split-second decisions and pull off some sick-ass combos, and it's the reason I kept coming back to the game. And you could also do the super fast anime swing attack, it's really cool. My main issue with Scourgebringer is that the roguelite mechanics just aren't all that interesting, and what feels like a game that could have been a rad boss rush adventure platformer is instead given random room generation to create a longer experience by forcing you to face the same enemies in slightly different configurations over and over again. While the first two areas are pretty standard, I'm a little mixed on how I feel about the later levels. Dodging enemies that explode projectiles when you kill them and trying to avoid lock-on lasers or barrages of bullets in rooms where everything teleports through walls sometimes makes you physically feel how fast your brain is expanding, but other times you lose half your health before you can even process what happened. It took me over 9 hours to beat the game once, and a lot of my best runs were carried on the back of the assault rifle, which felt leagues better than every other weapon I tried. Despite these frustrations, Scourgebringer is so fast-paced and intense that I'm often exhausted in a good way after every single run, despite them lasting less than 30 minutes. I highly suggest you check it out if you're interested in the fluid combat mechanics and cool boss fights, but don't go in expecting tons of weapons, abilities, and RNG to make runs feel unique every time. I gotta come clean. When I first started playing Everhood, I thought it was setting itself up to be an Undertale copy. From the character designs, to the choppy dialogue sounds, and even down to the exact same font, your first thoughts about this game may be similar to mine. But what starts as Undertale inspired quickly evolves into... What the fuck? In Everhood, fully titled Everhood, an ineffable tale of the inexpressible divine moments of truth, you explore a world filled with quirky characters while uncovering mysteries about what the fuck that title means. The game is packed with creativity and humor, from kart racing and a mini D&D campaign to tennis matches on the Smega. You know, classic home video game console. While the comedic writing is packed with charm, the game's highlight is definitely its battle system. It's somewhere in between a rhythm game and a bullet hell. Bosses fire waves of damaging blasts into the lanes of the battlefield in time with the music, and it's your job to simply survive. Dash back and forth and do sweet flip jumps to survive the onslaught of notes while fighting literally everything in the game. I tr- I trusted you 3D trash can model. Oh shit. The music is banging and the visuals are fucking wild. I mean, to be fair, you literally get high and fight big talking mushrooms at one point, so I'm not surprised. Since Everhood is a game that focuses on its music, the music isn't just banging. It's intense. You've got hardcore rave beats with synths so aggressive they called one of the songs Tinnitus Dance, intense guitar-filled rock and metal, and plenty of funky jazz tunes. The game appears very simplistic at first glance, but as you continue further, it toys with the blending of 2D characters with 3D objects and environments, which is both a cool artistic choice and an interesting way to enhance the cryptic atmosphere. Without spoiling too much of the plot, Everhood really gets interesting halfway through with its main gameplay twist. After exploring every area, fighting bosses, and meeting lovable friends, your character recovers their lost arm, which now allows you to fight back against everyone you've previously 
previously met. What was originally a run for your life bullet hell is now recontextualized into an action combat game where you can grab two of the same colored attacks to turn them into a blast of magic that can be fired back at each boss. This adds a whole new dimension to the game and reuses music and battles in a way that doesn't feel tedious or repetitive, especially when characters team up or introduce new phases after being attacked. My only issue isn't so much with the gameplay itself, but rather, I wish the game hadn't gone with a style that is so reminiscent of Undertale from an outside perspective. It's obvious the developers were heavily inspired and most likely decided that this was the best way to present their story and gameplay elements. It didn't at all take away from my enjoyment of the game, but Undertale is incredibly well known, meaning Everhood is now bound to continue receiving videos, reviews, and general coverage while being constantly compared in some capacity. I mean, it's how I started my review as well. I think Everhood is an incredibly unique and engaging experience that deserves to stand on its own, so if you're interested in a blood-pumping action bullet hell, or just a game filled with tons of wacky characters, jokes, references, and certified jams, throw your preconceived notions out the window and give it a try. I know your secret now. The tactic that lets you win, I found your weakness. Oh, I am Rob, former world champion, raised from the dead. If you've seen my Hades review or the video where I discussed collecting physical game soundtracks, you'll know that I'm a massive fan of Supergiant games. I can't necessarily say I've been a fan for a long time, as I only played through the rest of their library after Hades launched in September of 2020, but hey, time doesn't have to be a prerequisite for adoration. In various interviews, members of Supergiant have said that Hades wouldn't have been possible without the experience they've gained from their three previous creations, Bastion, Transistor, and Pyre. Since Pyre is primarily a visual novel, I'd wager that one of the most notable aspects is the writing. I mean, that's also most of the cons out of the way, as just mentioning that a lot of the game is reading might be a negative for some people, which also might be why Pyre isn't discussed as much as Supergiant's other titles. But it's not just the writing. Supergiant managed to immerse me in the world of Pyre and attached me to its characters faster than most games ever do by mixing every aspect of its storytelling with the gameplay mechanics themselves and that's where I think the genius of Pyre lies, just as the genius of Hades lies in tying a roguelike dungeon to the narrative drive of making it to the surface. Pyre introduces a cast of charming characters, but withholds their secrets, backstories, and motivations until after you get to know them. You quickly become connected with the members of the Nightwings as you make your way through the deadly warped underworld of the Downside. Fortunately, there is a way to make it back to the Commonwealth, Magic RPG Basketball. However, each time you clear the NBA Finals, you can only send one of your teammates home at a time. While its introduction was quick and surprising, the Ascension mechanic felt like one of the most impactful choices I've ever had to consistently make in a video game. Other than whether or not the dog should keep his mustache, of course. After each major victory, you are forced to choose who leaves the group permanently, and you can only choose one of your three highest leveled characters, which completely flips everything you know about RPGs on its head. Not only must you send one of your star players and potential favorites home from the get-go, but as you continue through each cycle of the rights, you must now level your teammates more evenly to develop a more balanced roster. Future team compositions and and dialogue events will be permanently shifted. Pyre does a great job at making you feel like a depressed piece of shit no matter who you choose to send home, so good on that one, Supergiant. Really love crying in the Discord call while I'm trying to show the funny basketball game to my friends. Who would you set free? I don't know. <laughs> no. no! I love all three of these characters. No! What do you mean? <laughs> What do you mean? Hell, if you want to lose every match and live in the downside forever with your new best friends, you can. Pyre is so dynamic that every player can have a different experience, as the story progresses no matter the result of any given match. In addition, the characters feel like complex, real team members. Based on who you're fighting, one might get depressed or fired up, or if you make someone play too often, they'll get sick. If I put the pretty harpy lady on my team, the giant demon woman who could snap all of my bones 
bones with her pinky finger will get angry and refuse to play. From a gameplay perspective, the rights are always exciting to play since they're spaced out between longer chunks of exploration and dialogue. RPG elements like experience, skills, and equipable items are present to add strategy and variety, but they aren't overly complicated. Supergiant's signature approach to difficulty makes a return, as turning on the Titan stars to make the AI stronger makes for a high-energy sport that requires real consideration for the team members you want to bring to each match. I have never really considered myself a fan of sports, but if there was a sport where mythical creatures shoot magic blasts at each other while triple backflipping over a poison pit to dunk a star ball into the opposing team's pyre, you might catch me watching that from time to time. I absolutely adore this game, and it's my strongest recommendation on the list, if you couldn't tell. I've definitely been singing its praises from a game design and writing perspective, but during the editing process I was reminded of just how much care and hard work the members of Supergiant are able to jam into everything they create. Each landscape and stadium is a magnificent painting, every song fits itself into the world like a diegetic puzzle piece, and the fact that I bought this game on sale for $6 feels like an actual crime. Well, that's all I've got for this installment. I hope you enjoyed my picks. If you have any indie games you think should be featured in this series or just want to share some hidden gems, feel free to leave a comment, consider subscribing if you enjoyed the video, and I have a Patreon. It exists. It's down there somewhere. Oh, you, you wanted an honorable mention? Yeah, sure, um... Tori 3D is right there and it's 99 cents. What more do you people want from me? 